All right, um, welcome everyone. I'm Alex McKaig, CNU Program Manager, back again with the fifth webinar in our series on CNU's Highways to Boulevards initiative. Today's webinar is demonstrating the economic benefits of freeway removal uh, made possible by a generous grant from the Ford Foundation. The Congress for the New Urbanism is the leading organization promoting walkable, mixed-use uh, de neighborhood development, sustainable communities, and healthier living conditions. If you haven't seen it yet, CNU recently released our 2014 Freeways Without Futures list. Uh, if you want to check that out, go to cnu.org backslash highways and click on 2014. And as always, today, if you have any questions during today's webinar, please click the bottom right. Uh, you can edit or uh, put in your questions, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation today. Um, so let's get started. One of the key precipitators of the current generation of freeway re removal campaigns today is cost. Maintaining public infrastructure uh, like elevated freeways is very expensive, and replacing these structures is even more so. Moreover, urban freeways keep adjacent land values down, uh, reducing income ta incoming taxes as much as they inhibit local connectivity on the street network. So there's a growing consensus that there are better alternatives. Joseph Minicozzi of Principal at Urban 3 in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, has made his mark doing expert research on the value, of value capture of mixed-use development and density. Uh, he's proven that old town centers, main streets, and mixed-use corridors yield much higher value for their, their municipalities than suburban sprawl. So this analysis is proving a powerful tool for cities demanding better returns on investment and urbanists arguing for denser mixed-use development. Following Joe's presentation today, CNU President John Norquist will comment and lead the Q&A. But first, the, uh, we'll give it to Joe. The floor is yours. mic on again. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, is the screen, are we getting full screen? Okay. Um, it's kind of ironic that uh, there was a picture in the flyer of a, a project in Syracuse. We happen to be doing a study in Syracuse. I'm going to go through Asheville first and then come back. And if we have time to get to, um, I'll go through Syracuse. So um, first, and this is still is not showing up full screen here. Am I doing something wrong? Um, so this is a quote from, um, I happen to be reading... Um, Lewis Mumford's book, it's called uh, The Urban Prospect from the 1960s, or uh, 1958. And um, this is kind of an interesting quote that he put in the, the document. It says, when, Ameri when the American people, through their Congress, voted last year, so he's talking about 1956, for a $26 billion highway program, the most charitable thing to assume about this action is that they hadn't the faintest notion of what they were doing. Within the next 15 years, they will doubtlessly find they, would, they will doubtless find out find out, but by that time it will be too late to correct all the damages to our cities and our countryside. To say nothing of the efficient organization of industry and transportation, that is ill-conceived and absurdly unbalanced program will have wrought. Um, I put that in here because it's kind of interesting that 15 years after he wrote this, um, the federal government will pass a law called the NEPA Act. Um, 
that essentially tries to mitigate some of these problems. But um, it was incredibly prescient that he wrote that. And the book is a scathing commentary on many of the things that we're dealing with right now um, with highways. So let's kind of bounce through Asheville real quickly. Um, at the time that this project was coming down in Asheville, I was working for this real estate development company. Um, and I volunteered to be part of the process as a designer, uh, but also as an analyst to work on the real estate numbers for the project. And here's what was going on. Um, <clears throat> it's on the edge of downtown. Downtown would be on the right-hand side of this, of this, uh, of this, um, let's see if I can get the cursor to move here. Uh, all right, I can't get the pointer to move. Um, anyway, it's on the right-hand side of, of the image, and there's basically this connection. Um, It'd be really nice if I could use the pointer. All right, I don't know what happened there. Uh. Okay, here we go. Can you all see the pointer? I don't know if you can or not. Um. Anyway, okay, whatever, screw it. I'm moving on. Um, so, uh, to show you where downtown is, here's downtown, this kind of cluster in here. Um, this is downtown in here. The highway project, currently the highway kind of comes up here, gets on a local road, and then drifts up. So it makes this kind of zigzaggy move which is really kind of weird um, that it does this kind of zig zipper move. To see it a little bit easier, this is just, the next slide is just the road section. So you can see where this little neck of Federal Highway is. Um, it's probably the most bizarre thing that I've ever seen, where a local road is a Federal Highway for about a mile. And it's been a huge part of um, uh, people's problems here uh, with collisions, with a lot of traffic accidents. But basically, everybody agrees that this connection would probably, where the dotted line is, would probably solve some of the issues. So um, let's move on here. So here's an aerial shot from the west looking into downtown, and you could see that ribbon of highway on the local road. So, But a lot of what was going on in the community was a conversation about a highway and not necessarily a conversation about the 500-acre area that's around it. So much of the um, conversation involved correcting that, you know, basically making the planning, uh, city planning aspects of this real to people. And to give you a little bit of an idea, when we got involved, it was around 2004. And I'm not, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but basically it's been going on since 1985. Um, but what you see here is a history of people trying to engage the process. And this is really important because when the federal government starts to do one of these projects, there's a timeline that everybody has to follow from start to end. And we got involved in that. And before I even moved to Asheville, you see in 1999, the citizens actually hired Walter Kulosh to get involved. Um, and so there's a new, numerous tri trials and errors, or trials and attempts to actually engage the DOT in this process. And part of this was because of previous fights that have happened. And I'll go ahead and point out, oops. All right, well, let me do this. Let me just. All right, it's not. Uh, the software is driving me nuts. Um, okay. All right, I'm not using the pointer anymore. But there's a cut. You can kind of see it through this mountain where they blew the mountain open. Um, that was hugely controversial. And basically, the citizens figured out that there was a federal process that could have been used uh, to ameliorate that. And they actually took it to court and won, but it was too late, and um, they lost that battle. Um, so they took that same knowledge into this process. All right. Yeah, I'm really starting to get annoyed with this cursor. Um, and I mentioned the process called NEPA. 
And that came about with this guy, uh, the Nixon administration, uh, 1970, adopted the uh, National Environmental Policy Act. And this is really important to know about because this is essentially the zoning code of, of how highways are supposed to work. And I'll go ahead and read the purpose of this document. It's, declare, it's to declare national policy which will encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment, to promote efforts which will prevent or eliminate damage to the environment in the biosphere, and stimulate the health and welfare of man to enrich the understanding of ecological systems and natural resources important to the nation. Now what you have to realize here is this is essentially the purpose for spending federal money. That when federal money gets spent, you're not supposed to harm the environment. You're not supposed to damage communities. So realize these rules are there that just are essentially being ignored. But um, inside the document, just to drill in a little bit more, um, and you all probably can't read this, but it says, it shall provide a full and fair discussion on the significant environmental impacts and shall inform decision makers of the public to the reasonable alternatives of which to avoid or minimize adverse impacts um, or to enhance the quality of the human environment. So realize this, that if a federal road project is happening, that's federal dollars, and the process is supposed to tell the local community the impacts, the adverse impacts that are going to happen, but also you're supposed to have reasonable alternatives. That's a really important set of words there. Reasonable and alternatives, plural. So not just one choice. You're supposed to have many choices, as many choices that you can reasonably concoct for an, for an impact. Um, it also talks about encouraging and facilitating community dialogue. Um, my, one of my favorite quotes which is utilizing a systematic and interdisciplinary approach which will ensure the integrated use of the natural and social sciences and the environmental design arts in planning and decision making which may have an impact on man's environment. So think about that, the, in, the, the interdisciplinary use of design and, and uh, land, land arts. So pulling out those words and just looking at that for a second and realizing these are the laws that actually support good urban design um, and an approach to solving these problems. Um, what was fu funny is I think at one meeting we asked the, um, the DOT team who their interdisciplinary team was. And they mentioned they had a structural engineer, a civil engineer, a highway engineer, a road engineer, and some other engineer, and then an anthropologist. You know, it's just, that's not the intent of the policy when you talk about social sciences and environmental design arts. They didn't have anybody on that team to do this. And I think it's that little flaw in the, in the step of how they approach design that essentially causes a lot of the problems. So. Um, in these documents, you have to understand them. This is the actual environmental impact statement or the draft. Um, each of those documents is about two inches thick. And we had to wade through these things to find different issues and engage, engage the process. You know, it wasn't about what we wanted or about um, ideal situations. This is about seeing how they address the impacts in our community and how they're writing them down for us. It's up to our community, the city and the county, to decide whether or not the impacts are, are tolerable. So yes, somebody's house will get hit. Yes, there will be a tree that gets knocked down. But, but we get to weigh whether or not there's a benefit to that cost. And in the impact statement, they're supposed to go through all the reasonable alternatives and explain all of their impacts. Um, this Again, I, I don't mean to, to beat a dead horse here, but this is really important stuff. So back to the design. One of the things that we saw with the design is all the designs cost the, cross the river at the same point. And many people in the community thought, is there a way to do it shorter and do less impact? So um, there was a group, again, I moved to Asheville in 2003. Um, there was a group that had already been formed in the 2000s, and they came up with really significant points um, that are super important even today. And I'll, just the, the first one is probably key which is the separation of interstate traffic from Patton Avenue. So the design guidelines from our community standpoint, our comment was essentially given in 2000 um, to DOT. There were a series of people already active in the community. Um, Mikkel Hansen was an American Institute of Architects member, and he championed um, an AIA 150 grant 
to actually use this project to engage the community. At the time, the American Institute of Architects gave away, um, I think we got $15,000 to engage a community process that'll change uh, or impact your community for the next 150 years. Um, and we were one of 12 organizations across the entire country that got this grant. Um, so we used the livable principles from the um, AIA, which basically are very reasonable, varying your transportation options, um, preserving urban centers, encouraging mixed-use developments. A lot of the tenants of, of the charter are here as well. Um, and some basic smart growth principles. Um, we started meeting. We had a volunteer group that wrote the grant and um, started the session and essentially created a nonprofit community design center in the process. And um, I'll tell you, this is kind of a difficult project to start with. Typically, you'll see design centers starting on bus stops and small little urban interventions, but we chose a billion dollar project. Why not? You know, it was kind of a little silly, but anyway, it was an important project in our community. Um, we started building a lot of community consensus by telling a story about what we were doing. So um, the design center was essentially creating a clubhouse uh, for people to get together, do research on projects, test out ideas, and try to find a way to bring solutions to the community. You see that fourth point is kind of important, a place for multidisciplinary interaction on real world problems. So it wasn't just architects. It wasn't just landscape architects. We had architects, landscape architects, planners, engineers, transportation engineers, advocates, uh, activists, attorneys. I mean, it was just a, it was a kind of a really complex group of people. And it was because our town is so small that it's easy for people to get engaged that way. But it's also because we don't have enough designers in town. To, to handle the problems. We opened up a an office um, on a main square. We did this to be very transparent, very open. Uh, here's the picture of the mayor cutting the ribbon. On the right is Bill Langdon. Um, it was actually his office that we moved into. We pushed him into the back of the room and took over the space. Jackie Shower on the left was head of the AIA um, when we won the grant. Um, the architects were very involved in this from the beginning um, and understood it. We held a series of open houses um, oops, to talk about design. And from the beginning, we were talking about trying to expand the concept from just being a highway to talking about how this stuff fits into the city and making sure that we're doing a highway but also not damaging the environment. Um, the, the, the surrounding region. And we were using pictures like this and explaining it to people um, that what we're trying to do is minimize those kind of leftover spaces. Um, again, back to the, to the alignment and trying to constantly talk about this as a 500 acre area and showing people kind of what it could look like. So here's the area of impact and the land that we're talking about. And let's just drop the same area over Charleston, South Carolina. That square is the uh, original tract of Charleston. And this is the amount of impact we're talking about. Or if the French Quarter, this much impact. Or all of Back Bay or the north end of Boston and Beacon Hill could fit in the impact area. Or if you've never been any place, we could reproduce all of downtown and um, build more forest. Aesthetics were really important to our community. Um, we engaged people by talking about the bridge design. This is the current bridge over the river. Uh, people think this is pretty boring. This is what we could have had. This is the original proposal for the bridge back in the 1920s. And when people see that, it captures their spirit and in, in interest in aesthetics. Um, typically, DOT just lets you pick a bridge color and maybe a medallion and a landscape planter. And that's not really getting involved in design. That It's just basically taking an ashto beam structure and putting graffiti on it. So to us, that's like putting lipstick on a pig. It, there's got to be a better way to do this. And one of the things that we talked about was the aesthetics of engineering and using like a Calatrava bridge. But this bridge is essentially designed to teeter on rock because there's mud on one side of the bridge. So all of the structure is on one side. So the structure becomes the aesthetics rather than just taking something and hammering it into the landscape. Um, you know, you don't have to be in Europe. You could be in South Carolina. This is a bridge in... Um, Greenville, just about 40 minutes down the road. And it's become an icon in the community. And um, even on the other end of I-26 down in Charleston, uh, Mayor Joe Riley got this bridge built. Um, and there's even double-decker bridges. This is one in Portland, Oregon. They actually have bike racks um, modeled after the bridge. 
And uh, not too far away is Fig, uh, Linda Fig, and uh, Fig Engineering. Uh, her firm did this bridge in the Natchez Trace, but they also did a bridge on the Blue Ridge Parkway that's locally pretty famous, um, the Linco Viaduct. So that essentially got people to understand that there are design components that aren't even being contemplated that are going to have a huge impact on our community um, to talk about. I'm just going to blow through this next section really quickly, but we basically got together as volunteers. We had charrettes. I mean, this is just like being in school. We just throw designs up on the wall and talk about them. Um, uh, incidentally, this is Alan McGuinn on the left, who was one of our first board chairs, and Michael McDonough on the right, uh, a local architect and CNU member. He's um, making a pitch for a boulevard project, and we'll come back to Michael's concept. Um, there were four designs on, alternatives on the table at that point in time. These are my cartoons that I drew to kind of dumb them down. You don't need to think about it too much. Um, but we'll just kind of blow through that that was alternative two, alternative three. Both of them collide the interstate on the local bridge, which doesn't meet our community's goals. So as far as we were concerned, they don't exist because the community is not going to support them because this was a voted and adopted document. It's in our city's 2025 plan. So we're moving on. Those are gone. There are two alternatives that popped out in 2006 at the time that we were working. And um, the DOT made their own design alternative of number five illegal. They said it's not going to work. So here's a question, and this is the question we pose to our community. When it says to provide reasonable alternatives, and there's an S there, how many alternatives do you see here? You know, it's like we've got one, one choice. Um, that's one of the things that was really frustrating through the process as a taxpayer, as somebody that lives in this community, to witness. Um, so we were in looking at that alternative, to some extent, it was the most horrendous. I mean, it took the most acreage. It had all the red stuff on the drawings here on the left, our bridges. It was a ridiculously large. Here's the current interchange with a little circle on it. Um, and here's what DOT is proposing. So essentially, like nine times the land area of the current interchange just to do the same maneuver, basically. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, um, oops, a little crash there. Um, so what it did do on the east side of the river, and you see the river in the center of the spot, the bridge is this kind of candy cane thing in the middle of the image. <clears throat> it did separate the highway. So we thought that was a good thing. Going back to the maps, and you'll see here that you can actually physically tell there's three separate maps. Let me see if I can get the pointer to work again here without crashing anything. Yep. All right, never mind. Um, we taped them together and pinned them on the wall because they were huge drawings. And what's crazy is all of the colors that DOT uses um, are in the language of DOT. They all mean something. Red means bridges. Neon green means new purchase right of way. Lime green means old existing right of way. And it's all code language, but when you're trying to communicate with citizens, it's hard enough as a designer to look at this stuff and figure out what's going on. Um, for the citizens, it's even harder because it's just yelling at you these colors. Um, so it's, you know, it's simple things like that, the design of information can actually help or hinder communication with your citizens. Um, so we basically just stripped it off and said, look, this is, this blue here is all the new proposed asphalt. And what we're trying to do is strip it all down to make a thinner line of spaghetti. So that's the yellow stuff was our design proposal. Um, of course, it wasn't easy. We were told by, D by our DOT staff that this was, you know, there was fatal flaws in here somewhere. And we asked them where, point them out, because we used really, you know, crazy stuff called tracing paper to trace their design. So if our design's illegal, their design's illegal. So it's, it's just, it was really, it wasn't, it wasn't a comfortable experience and it wasn't at all pleasant yet. We had to be diplomatic and we had to be patient and work with them, even though we're, these are our public officials that we're paying their salary. But um, So we also pointed out all the benefits of all of this um, to our uh, elected officials. We built a model out of roofing foam and had it so that you could, everybody can just kind of come in and see it. Um, this is a lo very low tech. Um, but the community process was incredibly important. This is a picture of the spillover of people that couldn't make it in the room on one night at the county commission hearing. And I'll get into this. We kept track of all the hours that people spent as volunteers. And there were over 96 volunteers in just one year um, that, that contributed over 2,000 hours. 
Now, when you're talking about that, that's an average of $100 an hour of billable time that people are taking out of their day to give to the community. So that represents $200,000 of community service. And these are, these are folks with jobs and they're professionals doing this stuff as a living. So we had to kind of constantly point that out. We weren't just some radical group of people that want to fight highways. So it was, we want to make better design for our community. We wanted to participate in this process in a multidisciplinary way. So my job in the team was to go out, and I used to joke that I would do birthday parties and bar mitzvahs. I, I would do anywhere anybody wanted to see what we were up to. I'd get sent out to do this PowerPoint and explain the design, explain the impacts to the Kiwanis Club, the Rotary Club, et cetera. Um, and DOT would do things. Um, and one time they came back and said, there's a, there's a curvature. We had a double-decker bridge, and they would say there's a curvature problem on the top deck. And we're looking at the cross-section of the bridge, and we're noticing that it's 37 feet from slab to slab on the top of the slab with 17 feet of clearance. So 37 minus 17 is, means that that structure is 20 feet thick. And we thought, well, this, that's just crazy. That's just like taking a simple ash tow beam bridge and just putting one on top of the other. They didn't really try to solve the design problem. We pointed this out to our city council folks, and they actually asked the engineers at the meeting, they said, so you're saying that you can't solve this curvature problem with, with engineering. You're saying as a licensed and registered engineer that you can't solve this problem. And of course, they all started backpedaling. And they basically said at that meeting that we weren't hired to solve a problem. We were only hired to look at a solution, which, you know, was very frustrating. <laughs> so let's just leave it at that. Um, the city and the county, and now at this time, the city and the county were pretty far apart for them to come together and say, look, we're going to give this nonprofit group some money so that they can go out and hire their own engineer and solve this problem. Because thank you very much, DOT, but please step aside. We're going to hire our own community. Um, that was pretty big. Uh, they gave us $80,000 to hire. Um, we hired Linda Figg's firm um, because of their experience in Western North Carolina, but also because of their experience in doing creative design. This is a, a structure. <laughs> going around a mountain on the Blue Ridge Parkway, and this thing is not 20 feet thick. So if they can do that, then I think this is a 10 feet maybe, um, they could help us. The other thing was taking the story out about Patton Avenue and getting that back. So this is Michael's drawing of turning it into a boulevard. And we actually bought, we called up Steve Price and bought these images um, from Arkansas, but they basically look just like our community and showed people what if you started adding in um, urban density. So this was a really simple way, rather than us trying to take the time to do all this stuff with Photoshop, we just called up Steve and um, bought the same visuals because it worked. Now the other thing that is really important is bringing data behind this because this whole EIS process is supposed to have data within it. So don't expect that you're going to be getting deep work in these EIS processes if you can do better. So we looked at the, the project area, and this is a shot showing the right-of-way with the river kind of in the center. Um, and this is all the right-of-way of, of our design 4B. And we basically said um, the key thing here, the river is in the center. Again, you can see 240. The dotted line is where 26 is going to cross. One of our main community goals was reconnecting this public housing with downtown. And you can see the public housing totally isolated by the highway. Um, so here's an aerial shot. And it, we worked with um, Urban Design Associates. Uh, we contracted with them for these watercolors. And they're beautiful renderings. But basically, we did the, the groundwork, the floor plans, the site plans for all the buildings and handed them this image. And they produced the infill. From, a, from an aerial. So let's go back. So you can see the, all the land that's currently right of way. And this is what we would get as infill. This is the current bridge today. And this is what it could become as a local boulevard. So this is the, the visual component explaining what we're trying to do. But we took it to the next step. What does this mean to our community financially? Um, so we ran lots of numbers. Um, you can see 4B, our, our design is alternative 4B. Um, on the right, and we're, you know, we had to bring this analysis in. What was our right of way? How many acres were we going to use? And we, we would simplify it down to, let's compare us against four, which, again, in our mind is the only one that was doable 
as, a, as an alternative. So we were trying to provide a reasonable adjustment of that. Um, so if we're 50% we're of the right-of-way, 50% of the bridges, 50% uh, of the square footage of bridge, bridges, so therefore we should be 50% of the cost. You know, that's, that's a very crude way of looking at it. We would take it to the next level uh, further down. The second thing we were doing is looking at all the real estate development that would happen on the east side of the bridge and the west side of the bridge, all the buildings that we would draw, and we would run the numbers on them. How much square footage is it? What would it fetch in the marketplace? What would it be appraised at? And then with that, we could say, well, what's if all this land is currently in right-of-way, which means it's non-taxable, if they were to become taxable buildings, how much would our community make in city, county, and school taxes? Because right now we can't, we don't get anything out of it, and it's our land in our community. So if we were to have it back, what would we make? So that's $111 million. If you look at all the taxes over 50 years brought to today, what does that mean? In the the language of real estate investment that's called net present value, which is what's the cost to a decision today? What's my net present value of this decision? So if we want to go down the other road, if we want to ignore getting this land back, we essentially lose $111 million. End of story. So we wanted that number so that we could put that into the EIS document. So this picture is essentially worth $111 million. So we actually looked at the DOT's work and put in the patent avenue opportunity cost on those two alternatives that that didn't give us the land back and then when you look at the total cost to taxpayers because they're saying oh there's a total project estimate but they're totally ignoring the opportunity cost that we would have by taking our land away so we put that in there and their design is more expensive than ours it was there's a lot of in this last column here, Alternative 4B, we have a lot of problems with the way that they costed out our project in specific. Um, just look at the right-of-way cost estimate line, and you see that Alternative 4 costs $60 million and ours costs $60 million even. So essentially what they're saying is, even though we save 23 acres of land near downtown, those 23 acres are only worth a $400,000 savings, which is absolute hooey. There's no way in hell that you can get land that cheap in our community. And we pointed that out, you know, but having the numbers and going through those numbers, this is how you affect design and this is how you can champion design. So um, just to kind of show you what it means, this is a, an aerial, or it's an, a, a plan of the city on a value per acre basis. So what's the tax productivity of different parts of our downtown? And you can see downtown popping out hot purple. And then as you go from the downtown, to the river, you can see how it starts to fall apart, and you see the big white gap where the where the highway interchange is. So we're already getting oranges around this area. So if we just had this land back, we can grow more of our community wealth. Um, to look at this in 3D, this is this is if you're hovering over Patton Avenue, looking into downtown, and you can kind of see where I've typed in the label of the French Broad River. You can see the big black hole of where that land is and what we wanted back. So at the very least, it's easy for the, the audience to see we could at least have yellow value in this area that's currently producing nothing, which is the same value as what you're getting over in West Asheville already. So this is a way to graphically show getting this value back to your community. Um, we ran taxable numbers per acre, showing that this is the current value. This is where we're trying to project it to let our community know that this is a way to harvest revenue for our community. It's not just about the highway. We're not saying don't do the highway. We're just saying we want this little piece back in this location. Um, there's also great information out there. The, the EPA site has all of this stuff that's supposed to be part of NEPA. Um, we know that our population is growing. We want to have that growth in our area. So if, uh, we also use some of Peter Kelthorpe's information about uh, BTUs per household in conventional urban versus suburban. And we were to say if if these 66 acres, so you see this first column, were used in a manner similar to the building that's already in our town up above, these are the miles driven versus if they went out into a, an associative sub suburban pattern. So we're able to run our, our miles driven, which makes our VMT, our vehicle miles traveled. We can figure out gasoline, we can figure out kilowatts and CO2 based off the gasoline and kilowatts as well as the local taxes. So we put all those numbers out there and explain them. And again, this, this whole PowerPoint will be 
y'all can uh, get a copy of it so you can read all of this stuff. I'm going pretty quickly through it. But what's important here is look at that, 37 million miles of VMT in the region we would save by growing inward rather than outward. Now again, when we talk about the impact and the environment, these are pretty important numbers to have out there, as well as the value to our community. We ran the real estate improvements value, we ran the, <clears throat> the, the additional cost to our community when you spread people out versus growing them in. So if, if this development doesn't happen, it's essentially, not only is it costing us $111 million in taxes, it's costing us $24 million in additional housing costs uh, to the to the city and the county, we lose those jobs. We already know what the jobs are in downtown, the job density. We know what the retail sales are, um, as well as the the jobs that would happen close to a downtown versus outside. So we put all of those numbers out there and said, here we'd like these to be part of your EIS process um, as part of your cumulative impact statement. Um, so I let you, know, you, said, you said I like to quote Michael Bloomberg. You know it's managing things and having data is where to start. Um, it also helps in these processes that are effectively engineered um, design issues. So that if it's all part of the process that they need to measure anyway, and we just helped in the process. Now I'm not going to say that it was completely easy to work with these guys either. Working with DOT was a little mind-blowing. Um, we did get them to accept our design into their EIS. And then we started working with them, and our design started changing. And you can see on the left it starts to get wide, and then on the right it gets really wide. They take the highway and shoot it over the top of Patton Avenue on the right. Uh, you can see where the red starts to go over the top of Patton Avenue. Now, who's, who's going to agree to having an aircraft carrier size of piece of concrete shooting out over a local road? So, of course, we got irritated about that. And we're like, no, this isn't our design anymore. So I got sent back out to the community. And I explained to the community, I said, look, our federal process says do a highway and minimize the impact, but you get to choose on the impact. So it's like saying eat, eat some fruit, right? And so DOT shows up at the state level. They hand the money to the state, and the state comes in and works with the local department. So our state official showed up from Raleigh and said, hey, you guys want some oranges? And we're like, no, 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 we don't, you know, oranges are cool. We don't really want an orange. In this location, we want an apple. So we designed an apple and said, just put it in your process as a choice with your oranges. And while we were working with DOT, they're like, hey, how about taking your apple and make it look more like an orange? And it was just, it was crazy, you know? And it's just, they're trying to find a way to put costs on our project that we didn't have in the beginning because we didn't want them. It wasn't part of our design. Physical, environmental, and construction costs that we didn't, totally didn't need. Um, so again, back to the EIS doc document and the EIS process. Going into them, we were basically pointing out to our community where we were finding inconsistency. We ran the numbers on the impacts, and we basically pointed out that the design that DOT is choosing is the only design that cuts into a, a in this case, a, a, a community of low wealth um, and whacks like 27 of their houses. Ours, our design didn't. We totally avoided the neighborhood. We tried to minimize the impact. Um, they also took a church which is kind of insane. And when you read the document, and just read here underneath churches here, it says, no churches will be displaced by any alternatives. But do you all see the sound wall that goes through this church? It gets whacked. And even when you look at their table, um, where you see church relocations, and I have it, you see a number one right there. This church gets hit. You know, so how is it that you can tell us no churches are being taken, and then you go ahead and whack one? Um, they say that there's substantial impact to the Burton Street neighborhood. You see I've got it squared off here. Yet when you read the document and you read community cohesion, there is no mention of the damage of 27 houses in Burton Street. I mean, it's unbelievable that within four inches of text, they would basically not write this stuff into it. It was, it was straight out of 1950 or something. It was just insane. Um, we went to the city council actually voted in favor of, it, of our work. The county voted against us. The day after the county voted against us, this was a cartoon that came out in the newspaper. Um, and I'm the guy in the back there saying what the whatever. Um, and it was, it was really kind of amazing that the Chamber of Commerce would come out and divide the county against the city. Now, this was in 2009. Um, there was a change of governor. 
so it was some mad rush to try to get this project done. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know what happened. We're still dealing with this. The project is still in hold uh, because of this. Um, so, uh, Alex, do I have do I have more time, or is this uh, is this the end? Because I've got the Syracuse project in here too. I've got five minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to whip really quickly through Syracuse. We went in there. I was actually doing a real estate analysis um, for the community, or we were um, doing the real estate analysis for the community, and they happened to be talking about I-81. And so we did a value per acre map of of uh, Syracuse, and you. The highway kind of cuts right through the middle of, of, of Syracuse. Um, their downtown is incredibly productive. Um, this is the downtown's property taxes per acre in the whole region based on zip code. This is the retail taxes. And there's a bit of a, a little bit of a friction there between the, the small called Destiny and downtown. And Destiny is kind of like the um, uh, Mall of the Americas for, uh, for that, that, that part of the central New York. So this is the total taxes, and it's kind, we were kind of blown away that downtown was producing more on a per acre basis than the mall. But this is with a caveat. We're still trying to figure out the retail taxes. It's kind of funny the way that New York does them. Uh, the jobs per acre downtown, again, is the big job creator, as well as the Hill area, which is Syracuse University. Um, and so we, we did this kind of series of x-rays uh, of the community as well. This is the street infrastructure, and you can see the highway cutting through in the north-south fashion is I-81, and in the east-west fashion is 690, um, which you can tell the damage that it did to the, infra the, the fabric of the community. Um, and you can almost envision the Syracuse University area and the, and the downtown more connected than the tissue shows. Um, now, when you add in the highways, it also brings in a whole bunch of surface parking to accommodate all that infrastructure. And this is essentially low-value real estate. And you can see as the further you go out on those highway bands, the more you see the infrastructure damage. Now you can pretty much tell where the mall is in the upper left there with a the big kind of white hole in the middle of the red parking lots. Um, now again, this is zooming in on the value. And you can see I-81 going into the fabric. There's a highway that kind of skirts around the outside called 481. And there's a conversation in the community to essentially try just change the name, call 481, call it 81, and let the community, let the traffic go around um, the community. Now this is a three-dimensional model looking into the city from the south. And you can kind of see 481, if, if you weren't from Syracuse, you would assume that that was the highway going around town. You wouldn't think that it would go right into town the way that it does. Um, this is just looking at the cities of Syracuse's property taxes per acre and just the downtown. Um, so the highway actually does neck down, and again, zooming in to seeing the downtown, you can see the highway necking in really, really small, but look at the footprint of 481. So these folks actually do have a legitimate, reasonable uh, stake to say, what if we just change the names? Um, now again, that's something to work out. Um, and the other thing that was kind of weird is we typically see a spike in the purple that kind of grows up. This is Chapel Hill, so you can see how it all peaks into a, um, a high point. When you're looking at Syracuse, you can see that the two are split between, almost like a field goal post, between the Hill District, which is the university in downtown Syracuse, and that's essentially right where the highway cuts through. So it essentially rips out that value. And again, you can see it here, and we'll kind of zoom in. Sorry. Um, so these are... This is a site plan of the area and an aerial looking in the site plan on the right. You can, you can see how small the highway gets. So the community essentially has to wrestle with this. They can't really upgrade the, the downtown highway without taking a lot of real estate, yet they have this other highway there already that they can easily just kind of swap or exchange. The, um, and, and DOT could still be happy and have their interstate going between Pennsylvania in Canada. Um, the infrastructure would still be there. They would just have to change the labels. Um, so again, zooming in to the downtown. On the right, you can see where the real estate is kind of in greens and yellows, which is in the lower end of the real estate value. And as soon as you get a couple blocks away from downtown, it starts to turn into purples and reds, which are the higher values. So this is kind of a good shot showing 
the the gray means it's non-taxable, so the hospital's sitting there, you've got the university and some public housing, and also government buildings on the left side of the highway. But generally speaking, the, 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 the taxable real estate is very depressed around the highway. So I'll, I'll end there. I think I've gone over my time, um, and I guess we can get into the questions. Should I be doing anything? Turn my mic off? What do I do? Uh, we're going to join you in one second. There you go. All right. So, uh, Joe, thank you very much. This is John Norquist. We're both on mic now, so you can answer me when I say something. Is yeah. he hearing that? Yeah, he can hear you. Okay. All right. So, um, this is really good, particularly uh, the part about Syracuse is interesting the the um, value per acre map which you're do now doing those in lots of cities around the country right uh, yes sir and um, like even Detroit has more value in the downtown than it does anywhere else in the metropolitan area per acre correct I would, I would, I would agree it's basically when you stack stories you're essentially stacking value so um you know, that's why these buildings produce such, such revenue and uh, wealth to the community. So, you know, as an urbanist, I find that, that uh, very attractive, uh, you know, that fact that you put out there a lot. The response that would come from people like my uh, fellow Chicagoan here, Bob Brueggemann, would say, well, so what? You know, that... In a lot of these communities, land is really cheap. So why why does it matter how much value you have per acre? Uh, why conserve land? Why not just let everything spread out if that's what people want? What what would be your response to Brueggemann? Um, you know, I, I I do hear that from time to time uh, that we you know this is America we can spread out. But as you spread, you extend your horizontal infrastructure. So there's a cost that comes along with that spread. It's not just free land. Um, so and it's not just land costs; it's it's the cost of servicing the land. Exactly, roads, the, the improvements on the land. Whatever, all, you know, all the the government promise in return to this development, right? The the infrastructure that comes along with the street, sewers, utilities, buses, police, garbage, whatever. Um, in the case of the highways, um, what we're what we're experiencing in is, is the engineer wants to do things 100% the way that engineers want to do them. And they're not taking in the other factors of environmental design and community design. So essentially, I, I, I liken it to letting the plumber design your house. You, know, you need a plumber, that's good. But you don't design your house based on plumbing efficiency. You know, if you did, you'd plumb your couch and call it a day. Yeah, it would, look, it would look like the... Uh... The building in Paris uh, that Richard Rogers did. Oh, the Pompidou Center? It's on the outside. I like uh, that building. Some people <laughs> like that building. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to try to uh, answer some of these questions that people asked. Melina Curry asked a question. Let's get to that one, Alex. Which was... There you go. All right. She said, maybe Joe will address this. I'm wondering if it only makes sense to take down state highways, um, to take down highways for those that carry traffic cars per day below a certain amount of cars, or if level of service and uh, ADT, average daily traffic, even matter. And let me answer that one before you do. Um, the the tear down in Seoul, South Korea, it's 160,000 cars a day going through the middle of downtown Seoul, and they didn't replace the capacity. They replaced it with two lanes, surface lanes in each direction, and it worked just fine because the street grid is so rich in Seoul. Um, so that's a lot of traffic, 160,000 cars a day. If we were going to set a cap, I'd start with that and maybe move up from there. What do you think? Uh, 
you know, I, I don't have the, the details on the numbers. I know that the folks in Syracuse are actually talking about, uh, because they do actually do have an incredible street grid that's essentially, I don't want to say it's over capacity. It's just, it's there and not being used. And um, because that highway did displace all of those trips. So that, that infrastructure is there. It just needs, it, it can be um, coordinated better and better utilized. So it's not, I guess what the Syracuse folks are saying is that we're okay with the number of lanes, just not all in one place. We already have all the lanes here. The grid can disperse the traffic. I think it's 90% of the trips on I-81 are local anyway. So they're, they're just like, why don't we just make better use of our existing infrastructure in, in Well, you know, and that's what happened with uh, the Embarcadero and the Central Artery. The city of San Francisco actually did a study that showed that the majority of trips actually got shorter in time uh, because people were actually able to go where they wanted to go and the traffic didn't concentrate on one big facility. One big property value killing facility, which is basically your argument, is that the uh, building a, a giant road through a, a complex fine grained fabric of a city reduces the value of the property near the road. Yeah, I would agree. And, and it's also, it's, you know, you, you see the purple is, is in areas that are of walkability, of what would be perceived as congested, difficult to get to yet it's still producing a lot of revenue and wealth because of the architecture and environment that's around it. So more of this is just to provide the information and allow the individuals at the local community to make better decisions for themselves. Um, it's frustrating to see the process um, that's intended by law, written by our federal government, to try to keep us from hurting ourselves, yet there's this entrenched bureaucracies and silos that get in the way. Um, they keep on practicing the way that they've practiced since the 50s. So that's kind of disheartening. Um, yeah, well, some of it, I, I, the, there's the issue of subsidiarity. In other words, you know, who pays for this stuff? Uh, and in Milwaukee, they built one freeway back in, the in 1949, the Stadium North, it later was called, but uh, the Stadium Freeway. And it, uh, it was a disaster for the city. I reduced property values, it concentrated traffic and created congestion at the ends of each, at each end of the freeway, they never would have built another freeway. They built it with their own money. Um, and in Canada, where there's no national highway program, no national transit program, and somehow the cities in Canada, most of them have really good transit, some have just, just good. Uh, and Somehow, miraculously, the highways connect between the provinces without a national, well, without the equivalent of an interstate highway program. Um, so I think part of the problem is, you know, the federal government is set up to build these roads and to solve a problem too narrowly. They, they focus just on congestion and nothing else. And streets in the urban context have other purposes, you know, selling stuff, a setting for real estate value, a social setting which enhances real estate and economic value. So your, uh, your, your work is really important here, Joe, because people want to know uh, what's the right thing to do for a community. If they, if they really do want to answer that question, then they need your map. They need your property map that shows us. Somebody asked about the Park East Freeway and Whenever I talk about it, I always point out that a lot of it hasn't been built out yet. I, I do that because I want to be honest about it, but the fact is there's still been a uh, couple hundred million dollars of development uh, along it uh, in, in the land where the freeway is, and there's been over half a billion dollars of development along the edges of it, um, even though uh, some of the land is still vacant. The reason, in my opinion, it's still vacant is that the county, which owns that land, put on it a uh, bunch of social conditions that are almost impossible to meet unless you get subsidies from the government, which they're not willing to pay, which is sort of a, a warning to communities other than ones that are like rich, like San Francisco, where they can 
oppressed property owners at will and still have great property growth. Um, but when you're talking about these Midwestern cities like Milwaukee, you, you really can't require, uh, you know, a special high wage requirement on a parcel of property and expect it to, to move very fast in the real estate market. But anyway, that's another story. Um, let's, uh, uh, Chuck Bannis of Buffalo says, do these economic arguments hold any weight with DOT, and you partially answered that question by saying basically no, but uh, is anybody in the Tennessee, I mean the North Carolina DOT, uh, buy into the, your argument that that infra road infrastructure in cities should actually add value to the place where it's built? Um, that's a tough one to answer. I mean, in theory, they adopted complete streets policies. So technically speaking, they're supposed to be doing what we're doing. Um, well, the definition the of complete streets is so broad that it's hard not to. I mean, Mississippi has a complete streets policy. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, Twelve foot lane for bicycles, fine. Twelve foot lane for transit, fine. Twelve foot lane for walking, fine. And then yeah. they, all, they all end up in car lanes in the end. But think, at least it's think, a complete I think, street. I think. I think the key. Uh, the key part of all your was was going out and talking to regular people, you know, going to putting a title into all the different groups and associations and explaining to them that it's our choice, it's our community. Regardless of what DOT wants to do, DOT is just spending federal dollars for the most part. Ninety percent of the project is federal money. That that our job in our community is to decide which one impacts us less and make that cost benefit analysis that ultimately it's still our community. And it empowered our community to actually stand up for itself. So whether or not DOT wants to do this stuff, they're technically legally obligated to do it. Doesn't mean they're going to do it. Um, or they might do an impact statement that says there's there's impacts going on, and they just won't weigh them. So um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we have to be vigilant to follow the process, know what, our, know what the rules of engagement are, what are the what are the laws that are set up to help our communities? And we have to play within those. This is just like a big zoning code for highways, basically. And you have to play within the rules of engagement. If you don't, you miss an opportunity. Our community went through that process early on with that blowing up the mountain project that allowed the mall to go on the other side of the, high, the mountain, which killed our downtown. We learned from that experience that we had to be within the time frames of public comment of all the engagement periods and all of that. So we essentially made that three-dimensional model on roofing foam as our public comment during the EIS process and took it to the DOT meeting and said, here's what we want. Um, in, our, in, in, in defense of our DOT, they've been very open to allowing us to be part of the process. And I honestly don't know who the person is behind the decision of choosing alternative number three because nothing makes sense in any of this project or process and there's a lot of opacity in there um, that it's hard to find out where the, the devil in the details is. Uh, but ultimately, our community is steadfast, stood behind a better alternative for our community. That's why we've gone through all these steps uh, in the process. I, the jury's still out. This has been going on since 1989. We're still waiting, you know. I'm a little worried about, you know, trying to make the whole thing about uh, opening up the process to more public opinion. One, one of the things we're trying to do at CNU with our partners at the Institute of Transportation Engineers is is to get uh, street engineering that adds value to cities to be a normal part of a, a traffic engineer's portfolio so that when he's presented with a, with a project in a city, in an urban environment, or even a suburban, urbanized environment, that uh, they'll use um, they'll use a different set of criteria than they normally would with a rural highway. Unfortunately, right now most of them are using the rural highway criteria because that's what they've been taught to do. Well, that's why we used well, that's why we used Walter Kulosh, we used Fig Engineering, we used Rockner. These were all engineers. We basically said, look, if you don't want to listen to us, we'll hire our own engineer and you talk with them. And, you know, it was in the process that they would, you know, 
the engineers would come back to us and communicate saying, look, here's where they're actually following policy and here's where they're just making stuff up. Um, and they would get frustrated too. And there, you know, it came a time where, <clears throat> you know, it's, they would say it's the FHWA, the, the Federal Highway Administration is asking for this stuff. And we would ask them, just tell us who this person is, who, who at FHWA is asking our design engineers to not follow federal law. Just help us out here. And I don't know if there's just someone that just needs to retire. I don't. We don't. We don't know who the pro, no one would ever out the person. And so, um, you know, we don't know if it's a real or perceived threat. It's just this. Where you, it's just the government coat of arms, where you point the finger at somebody else. You know, you, exactly. it's uh, it's not my. I didn't do it. It's not my responsibility. The feds made me do it. But the federal government, the FHWA, has actually endorsed the ITE Street Guide as the. Uh, way to do flexibility to the Ashto Green Book in urban context. So uh, anyway, um, we have uh, the Congress coming up in Buffalo this year, and uh, there's a lot of uh, freeway infrastructure in Buffalo that has reached the end of its design life. Um, some of that infrastructure was built on top of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's parkways and boulevards. Um, and now uh, there's a growing movement in Buffalo to take out some of that freeway infrastructure, which was pushed by our the historic uh, road enthusiast, Robert Moses. So um, CNU 22 is coming up. I wanted to give it a plug. It's our show. We have to advertise ourselves. And Joe, I want to thank you. You're one of the intellectual leaders in this whole thing, get, helping people understand what adds value to cities, what adds value to neighborhoods. Uh, and we really, really appreciate your coming on uh, to uh, educate our listeners. Well, thank you. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. This was fun. This fun. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. See you all in Buffalo.